to do is to hand over to Rajin and I we are recording this session just so everybody knows um, and so I'm going to make Rajin you I'm going to make you host okay and I hopefully you should be able to spotlight your video and then share your screen okay and then that will mean everyone will see you and then you can share your screen. So welcome to Regine. Thank you very much, Susanna. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. And I'm sorry to those that were expecting me two weeks ago, um, but I'm here today. So thank you very much. So I've been invited to talk about um, seasonal herbalism and what summer can offer us. Um, I'm just going to admit this person, sorry. Um, so first and foremost, I thought I would just clarify what a herbalist is, because a lot of people are a bit uncertain as to what it is. So basically, a, a medical herbalist is somebody that has typically gone through a degree course in medical herbalism, and we combine science-led research with traditional use of herbal medicine. Uh, some of the modules contained in the degree are pathophysiology, botany, diagnostic skills, and pharmacy. Um, so seasonal herbalism is more of a slower practice and, re and it, it requires patience. Um, it allows us to observe and connect with the changing seasons and how they impact our surroundings and ourselves. So what does summer bring us? Um, everything. It, it, it brings sunshine, it brings us health, it brings us exercise, but also obviously it brings us herbs, foods and medicinal herbs. So summertime is really good for flowers, leaves, berries, hips and haws specifically. So during the springtime, the plant's phytochemicals, and what I mean by phytochemicals is the plants, um, the constituents within them, which make them grow, which make them antibacterial. They have hormones, all of their, um, all of their, um, sorry. Um, the plants, the building blocks which make them plants, which make them strong. So in springtime, they surge from the roots up into the shoot and to the, into the leaves and the flowers to produce more. So, and that obviously crosses over into summer. And that's when we can really benefit from them because there's loads, there's an abundance, and we can pick them, we can make use of them. So a lot of plants, phytochemicals, the um, contain things like antimicrobials, antiseptic, stuff that's going to have a defense against insects. So we take those phytochemicals within us to help our bodies as well. So I just thought I'd clarify what phytochemicals are. I'm just going to try and share my um, hand up with you. I've never done this before on Zoom, so please be um, patient with me. I'm going to try it. Has that come up for you guys? It's come up as black, actually. Right. OK. It says that you're sharing your screen, but it might be that you've chosen the wrong window. You have to then select which window you want to share. OK, one second. Sorry about this, everybody. How about now? Is it share? Is it still showing a black screen? It is. Yeah, it is on mine at any rate. Yeah. <coughs> right. <clears throat> Hello, um, it's Yvette. I'm sorry for being late joining you. That's all right. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. Thank you. If I'm unable to share, all I can do is I can um, put my email down and, or I can accept, uh, take everybody's emails and then I can um, send it to them individually because I'm not, I'm really sorry about this, but it's, I don't know how it's saying to share screen and it's um, the only option it's giving me is this and it's becoming a black screen. Okay. Like share it in the time. chat. If you could upload it in the chat and then we can get it from there. Okay. We'll save your email. Okay. 
Okay, I'll try that. Cool. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll crack on. I'll try and do that because I know that we're a bit, um, we haven't got a lot of time, so I'll try to do that. You could always do that at the end, actually, unless you want people to be able to see it as you're going through. Yeah, I'll just do it at the end if that's, I'll try to do it, and, but I, I, I will, um, if not, I'll do it at the end if that's okay with everybody else. Yeah. Okay, so I was talking about how the plant phytochemicals and nutrients surge towards spring and summer. And that's one of the best times when we can utilize the, the flowers, the leaves, the berries, everything that comes in summer. And I'm just gonna try it one more time. And this is the, also the plants phytochemicals, they, they wax and wane throughout the seasons as well. It's not just that they, um, Sorry, I'm just trying to upload this. If it's not going to work, I'm just going to crack on because I, I, I'm going to, I don't want to keep interrupting. So the plants' phytochemicals change between the season as well. Sometimes they'll be stronger or they'll be more present within the wintertime. Sometimes they'll be more present within the summertime. And that's specifically true of stuff like tannins. So, so what... Ro Rogine, sorry, just to interrupt you, could you spotlight your video because then it'll be you that everyone sees and if anybody else makes a noise they won't then pop up if that makes sense so if okay. you go do you know how to do that <laughs> no i'm so sorry let me give it a go All right so if you go over it. yourself and there's a little drop down and then you mm -hmm. go spotlight video oh uh, yes yeah yeah and it just means it'll stick on you okay right <laughs> Sorry, right, so the plant's phytochemicals change throughout the season. They are more prominent within the spring and summer. So this is when we're going to be using the more, the leaves, the fruits and the berries. So common early summer plants are things like um, stellari or chickweed, <clears throat> cleavers, which is gallium aphorine, colt's foot, uh, wild garlic and nettles and hawthorn leaf and flower. Common midsummer plants are things like uh, chamomile, elderflower, St. John's wort, um, mints, pineapple, uh, calendula, cherries, linden blossom and linden leaves, and the common late summer plants are hawthorn berry, blackberry, rosehip, elderberries, yarrow and hazelnuts. So these are the plants that are more common in, in summer, but what, what, how much of these do we think of them as weeds? So weeds have a pretty lowly reputation, but it's completely undeserved, um, such as Weeds such as dandelions, nettles and plantains are brimming with nutritional and medicinal value for our mutual benefit. When we pick them, that spreads the seeds and then we can eat them. We can intake of those nutritional and medicinal qualities. So wild food, if picked correctly and in clean environments, is akin to organic food, but on steroids. And what I mean by that is they, are, they haven't gone through the same process as a lot of, as a lot of the crop herbs have gone through they're stronger they have had to fight for space they've had to fight for light they've had to fight off insects so they've got a stronger system than those crops that wouldn't have to and as a result they have higher medicinal nutritional values and then in the summer months we can interchange a lot of the things that we would potentially buy from supermarkets and crop foods as weeds so typically we could use stuff like wild garlic pesto or lavender lemonade and nettle soup. So I've written a few recipes here. <clears throat> so obviously there's wild garlic pesto. Is anybody, I don't know if anybody's going to be able to answer, but has anybody found any wild garlic in London at all growing wild? I found a very small patch and I've been eking out my wild garlic, which I've been storing in the freezer for a really long time. We have we have planted some bulbs in our community gardens, so we're hoping. Ah, fantastic! Fantastic. There, there is some in um, the uh, Frank Country Park. Ah, right, excellent. I found a little I found a little patch by me, and I've been really secretive about where it is, but I've been using it, and it's just I love it. And of course, there's nettle soup. Um, so nettle soup is one of the most mineral rich plants there are. It's fantastic nutritionally, but it's also fantastic for summer 
conditions like hay fever. It's one of the most an antihistamine foods that there are. And I will talk about that more later. But nettle soup is one of the recipes that we can definitely use in summer, throughout summer, early summer, mid and late, as long as you pick it clean. And chickweed pesto and rosehip syrup. So rosehips contain approximately 20 times more vitamin C than oranges. And I think around World War II, there was a big push for everybody to go and collect rose hips and to make food with their rose hips because of um, the lack of food and rationing. And um, dandelion honey. So this is not a, a true honey in the sense that it's, but it's using sugar and dandelions. Um, dandelions are really good for um, high blood pressure and water retention. They are really rich in potassium and vitamin A and vitamin K. So why should we be making summer remedies? In my opinion, it, it, it gives us an autonomy over our health. It, makes, it gives us a direct link between what we put into our bodies and how it affects our health. It also recognises that the kind of hunter-gatherer in us it, with it, with it, that is innate in all of us. And it also helps um, with our vitamin D and our exercise. It has a whole sort of plethora of health benefits. If we're outside and we're collecting herbs and we're collecting plants, that's going to have a beneficial impact on our skin, our vitamin D in, in, intake. And even the air that we're breathing when we're in nature has a beneficial impact with um, the antimicrobial air, the qualities within air. And there's been a study recently about actually looking at green and looking at nature and how that has a positive impact on us. It lowers anxiety and it boosts our mood just by physically looking at green and nature. <coughs> so traditionally preserving and storing medicinal plants helped us survive through nutrient sparse winter. So there's a whole host of reasons. I think a lot of people do it because of a personal reason. It get, we gain joy through it, but there's also other health related benefits to it too. So harvesting in summer time can become extremely chaotic. And I know that most of you are gardeners. So I know what, you know how it feels like when you've got a whole host of fruits and veg, especially courgettes, tomatoes that you need to get through. And it can be the same with collecting plants and herbs in summertime. So because of this, I would suggest if you do want to collect plants and herbs in summer, that you start with just two or three key things that you have a personal interest in. Um, so the most common ones that you could choose depending on where you are, but hawthorn is absolutely everywhere at the moment. That's a really good one and very nutritional as well as medicinal. So there's many ways that you can, that you're able to preserve the plants or herbs that you have collected. But I would suggest just drying them is probably the safest and the easiest and simplest method because when you dry something, you reduce the water content so then it becomes less likely to spoil and to rot. And then when you've dried it, you can then turn it into lots of different types of um, remedies like oils or tinctures or anything like that. The best way to dry plants, in my opinion, is just by gathering them at the stems. So let's say we're gathering nettles, gather them by the stems, take a handful and tie them at the top and hang them in a dry space away from moisture and sunlight. Or you can buy the drying racks, they're quite useful as well, but they take up quite a lot of space. So on the handout here, I've done a St. John's wort oil recipe. So St. John's wort, its botanical name is Hypericum perforatum. And it's perforatum is because of the tiny, what looks like um, holes inside the leaf. And again, I found a little patch of um, Hypericum close to me, a very small patch that I've been using. So before its extensive research into um, helping with mood and depression and anxiety, St. John's wort was traditionally used as a nerve pain agent. Very good for things like shingles um, and nerves and bruises and aches and stuff like that. And it also traditionally has a use for sunburn relief. And it's beautiful that it has a sort of symbiosis between St. John's wort and the summertime, because if you've ever looked at St. John's wort, it just looks just beautiful it represents summer to me it's so vibrant and yellow and it has such a short time of flowering 
if you do find some St. John's wort to use, which I recommend you hunt down, um, try and get it before the flowers have fully gone into, while they're still slightly budding, while they're still coming into flower, just before they fully go into flower. So now I'm going to be talking a little bit about <clears throat> summertime conditions and recipes, things we can use. So I've spoken a little bit about why we should choose summer plants because they're, they're most phytochemical rich, why we should pick herbal medicine and plants because it gives us an autonomy over our health. But now I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the conditions that a lot of us get in the summertime and plants that we can use to help us. So sunburn, I'm quite fair, I'm very freckly. So I often get, or I used to get sunburn a lot. I'm seeing a lot of uh, chat coming up and I will leave 15 minutes at the end to answer those questions if that's okay with everybody else. So sunburn is obviously characterized by an overexposure of sun to the skin and causes redness to the epidermis and dermis. And some extreme cases it can cause fatigue. So treatment, first and foremost is to hydrate. When we hydrate, we're, al we're allowing our cells to heal quicker, more rapidly and more efficiently. So when you hydrate, it doesn't have to just be water. You can infuse that water with something like rose, um, cleavers or chamomile. Has anybody done a, well, there's a really beautiful thing you can do with uh, cleavers. There's lots of different names for cleavers. I used to call them sticky willies, but I know a lot of people call them cleavers. If you get some cleavers, a handful, and you put them into a water bottle and you put it in the fridge with water overnight and you let it cold infuse, it's a really beautiful um, lymphatic and it's a very good remedy for the summer heat because it cools you down and it helps your lymphatic system work more efficiently. So secondly, obviously I'm sure everybody's heard of aloe vera for sunburn, but it's, it's beyond par, it's fantastic. And if you have, if you can grow your own aloe vera at home in the bathroom, and if you know you've, if you've overexposed yourself to sun, if you put a leaf in the fridge and you cut it open half an hour later and you put that on, it's going to be extremely cooling to the skin, to the dermis. It's going to help it heal quicker. And next is lavender. So lavender essential oil is one of the few oils that you can apply topically to the skin without having to prior dilute it. So if you have a sunburn, you can either put some oil directly onto the skin or you can put it into a bath that's going to have the same effect a cool bath obviously and if the itch sometimes you get a really bad itch with sunburn if you put into the bath lavender it could even be fresh lavender but essential oil is going to be better and some bicarbonate of soda it's going to take away the itching and it's going to help with the speeding up of the healing of the skin so next i want to talk about um hay fever so I've only ever suffered hay fever once in my life um, and it was a few years ago it just came on one summer and I was shocked I was like what is this this is horrific and it had gave me so much more empathy for people that suffer this every summer it's really bad um, but it can be managed um, with lots of different plants and herbs and 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 dietary changes so first and foremost, I just wanted to talk about honey because there's a lot of a lot of people tend to recommend local honey for hay fever. And there is no academic research to back this up, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't work. But it just means that there's no research that I can pull on to say this is this shows you that it does actually work. But it is anti inflammatory. So what hay fever is, it's a histamine reaction and histamine in the body creates inflammation. So when you have a release of histamine, you have a release of inflammation that's why you get the, the itching or the runny nose the watering eyes that's all in an inflammatory response from this histamine so a lot of people will take anti-histamine tablets which i completely understand some people need, uh, need to um, but there are plants that have the same properties of antihistamine um, <clears throat> number number one is um nettles as again, I've mentioned before, nettles is one of the most mineral rich plants uh, there are. Less than six months. Nothing new. Um, so fresh or dried nettle tea or soup is going to be sufficient for this. 
So if you want to gather your nettles, always uh, gather the, just the top yeah, and so yeah, the... Jean, if you yeah. just mute everyone, okay. so at the bottom of the participants, you should be able to mute everyone and then that will stop the interruptions from people who aren't muted already. Thank you. I'm so sorry, everybody, that I'm such a technophobe. I'm so this bad is... at right, um, Zoom. Right, how to mute. Oh, should Zoom mute should say mute all okay can you see that no nope. have you got the participants up yes Blade? right yes yeah, so at Thank the bottom of much. that screen there mm -hmm. should be something which says mute all which you can do now as the host unfortunately i can't because i've made you the host okay Sorry, guys. Or you can just click on the microphone next to the people. Okay. That's the other alternative, and that will also mute them. Okay. Right, so where do I get to? Hay fever, nettles. So I have nothing against using anti-allergy tablets if that's required. Um, I'm not somebody that's against conventional medicine at all. But I just think that sometimes we can work in a more um, sympathetic approach to ourselves. When we're taking an anti-allergy tablet, it's basically like this is the inflammation or this is our system telling us that there's something wrong and we need to have our immune system ready to respond to this thing that's not, at all, that's not um, harmful. It's sending out these signals to our body that we need to be ready for a, a, an attack and the anti-allergy tablet comes in and just shuts down that whole system whereas if you take something like nettles or german chamomile that have a really high level of antihistamine naturally found within them they kind of come in and they block those receptors gently we're well, using plants to counterbalance a plant allergy it in my mind it just seems much more sympathetic to our bodies rather than to completely stop the the response and of course with anti-allergy tablets i know that they can become less effective over time and because we're using phytochemicals and they will vary between each plant we're not having this homogeneous level of antihistamines and, and other phytonutrients throughout so a way you can use nettles is to always just pick the first few stems because they're going to be the most nutritious and they're going to be the most medicinal so the early early summer and mid and early to mid summer that's fine to just pick those top few um springs sprigs sorry and you can either lay them on dry, drying racks or on tea like a thin muslin or tea towels to dry and you can use them as tea you don't have to dry them it just make it increases the the medicinal phytonutrients within them or you can just have it as a fresh tea <clears throat> or as a soup um or you can make your own um tincture if you like And German chamomile. So Roman chamomile and German chamomile can be used interchangeably, but German chamomile has, the, has a bigger concentration of the chemical constituent called azuline, which is the antihistamine chemical compound. So if you're going to be using chamomile for hay fever, I would definitely recommend German chamomile. And elderflowers. So obviously we get elderflowers in the early to mid summer and they're really fantastic as a prophylactic against hay fever. Again, they're really high in the um, antihistamine compounds. So if you suffer from hay fever every summer and you know it's going to happen, I would definitely recommend you drink elderflower tea from mid to late spring, early summer. So that's going to help counterbalance that and then start taking in the nettles and German chamomile. So another thing that every, everybody seems to suffer from a lot in summertime is the bites and stings and scratches as well from just running around in nature. So often bites and stings can um, resolve themselves very quickly, but they can be uncomfortable, especially if you get a lot of um, some people get a, a big allergic reaction to them to mosquitoes and you, they look really painful, those welts. I just want to note here that um, Lyme disease is caused by ticks and you will typically get a bullseye red rash 
with Lyme disease and that does need to be treated quickly um, by a doctor you need to be um, prescribed medication for that but apart from that typical bites and stings so my go-to remedy for bites and stings is plantain plantago and you can use the long leaf plantain or the broad leaf plantain interchangeably they have more or less the same chemical constituents and if you've ever pulled apart a plantain leaf you'll see that it's very fibrous and you can get that kind of slime mucilaginous from it so if you want to use it as a herbal medicine you can use it straight especially with a bite and sting you can just tear it from the ground and you want to bruise it break it up a little bit so it releases that chemical constituent that mucilage and you apply it to the affected area that's going to be number one easy peasy out in the go treatment but if you want to be more prepared for these things if you do suffer from bites and stings if you get a bad reaction to bites and stings every summer it would be really nice if you could make a um, plantain oil or a plantain bam and i have put these recipes in the um handout which i'm going to attach at the end um with plantain, because it does have that fibrousness quality to it, you do have to chop it quite finely to make it into an oil, about one centimetre by one centimetre. I've got the recipe on the handout, but I'll just run through it very quickly. So to pick, pick plantain leaf before midday on a dry day and chop them roughly into one centimetre by one centimetre pieces and place into a clean sterile jar <clears throat> and push the leaves down. You need to squash them down and cover with olive oil. Olive oil is the best oil to use in these kind of remedies, unless you want to use very expensive oil. And then you just label and date and you put it in a dark place to, to soak and to macerate for two to six weeks. And after that time has elapsed, you strain out using clean apparatus and then you um, bottle, date and label. And from this oil, then you can then turn that into a BAM. So obviously if you have the oil, that's really good to keep at home, but it's not so practical to carry around with you. But you can then turn that oil into a BAM by adding beeswax. And I've got the um, breakdown of how you do that on the handout. It's very easy, you just use oil and beeswax and I've got the ratios there and you can just pour into little um, tin tubs that you can get at Boots or anywhere like that to carry around with you. But I've also got a, um, an insect repellent, a natural insect repellent um, containing geranium essential oil. So there's some research that suggests that geranium actually deters uh, the ticks that carry Lyme disease. So this is a really good um, insect deterrent. And it's stuff that you probably have heard of as well, but it's just geranium, citronella. I know you can get citronella, citronella candles to, to burn in your garden to deter insects eucalyptus, lavender oil, rosemary essential oil, um, water or vinegar, and witch hazel. So you put that all together in these, um, in these in little spray bottle, you shake it up with a bit of water, and obviously the water and the oil are going to separate, and then you just shake them back up again. And that's really good to just spray on your clothes, or on your body, if you know that you're going to a place that's susceptible to, that you're going to be bitten or stung. So this herb that we really want to be using for bites and stings is a cooling plant, like I've said, like plantain, that's going to deliver an anti-inflammatory effect. It's going to cool the skin and it's going to have a mucilage, which it's a protective gel-like layer to the skin. So I know that we're coming close to the end of summer, but now we're coming close to um, berries, hips and haw season. And berries, hips and haws are really rich in anthrocyanins and in antioxidants. So herbs that help the inflammation process. So if you are prone to hay fever or something that is a, an inflammatory response, make sure that you are still collecting these hips, haws and berries that are going to help that inflammatory response as well. And I'm now going to open up to some questions. And I'm going to try and attach my hand out as well. So I'm going to unmute everybody. Or they can unmute themselves.
and I'm going to try and answer some of these questions that people have written to me as well. So is there any questions that anybody would like to ask and what I've spoken about? And please forgive me, I've been really nervous this session. I've never spoken to 30 people on Zoom. So please, if I kind of got a bit of a, a off on a tangent, I do apologize. Okay. I think I've enabled everybody to un. So I'm just going to try and answer some, answer some of these questions. And if anybody wants to ask one uh, by speaking, you're more than welcome to. So somebody has asked, is there for a later number of leaves of dandelion, et cetera, to make it worthwhile to have a medicinal effect? I'm not 100% certain of the question for later number of leaves of dandelion. If you want to write that again, is, do you mean the leaves or the flowers? And yes, St. John's wort does need to be taken with care internally, especially if you're on other medications. St. John's wort can also sometimes cause photosensitivity. So you should apply it. If you're making the St. John's wort oil, you should just apply a little bit like a test patch and to make sure there's no photosensitivity. So there's no blistering or reaction from the sun. Not bought chamomile tea just as good. Um, unfortunately, not. Um, you can get some really good quality dried teas, herbal teas, but very often I kind of like say that it's almost like the dust that they're using. They're not really using the most vital parts of the leaf. When you're getting a dried herb, you should be able to tell the quality by the look and the smell. Does it still look vibrant? If it still looks vibrant, then it still contains some of its nutritional and medicinal qualities. Does it still smell good? Does it still smell like the plant should when it's fresh? If it does, then it still contains those medicinal qualities. And very often I find with shop-bought herbal teas, they don't look vibrant and they don't look, they don't smell vibrant. And chamomile is really, it's pretty easy to grow. And I, there's quite a lot of chamomile up in Wormwood scrubs close to where I live that's growing wild. So there's quite a lot about at the moment. So if you can find some and pick some, that's what I would recommend. And where can you find plantain leaves? So plantain leaves used to be called by the Anglo-Saxons uh, waybread. And what they're meant by that is a broad way. So it would grow anywhere that people would walk. So it's probably one of the most resilient uh, weeds alongside dandelions it grows absolutely everywhere if you click in and look into google you'll find two main types there's plantago lanceolata which is the long-leafed plantain and then there's plantago ma major which is the broadleaf plantain and they can both be used interchangeably but if you go to any common ground or even park you will definitely find plantain and in fact right now the seeds are coming out and they're really um good to use interchangeably for psyllium husks, so like a bulking agent. Thank you very much for everybody being so kind. Number of leaves required to make a medicinal plant. So I think if you're talking in terms of dandelion, if you, it, because when you dry them, they become tiny. So you want to be able to gather about, <coughs> if you're going to be gathering herb, this is going to be like I suggested earlier, if you're going to, if you're going to focus on two or three medicinal plants. I would suggest that you gather about a, a plastic bag's full worth of dandelion leaves because they dry, they shrink massively. If you're going to use that as your one herb to, to, to have over summer, winter and autumn, about a, a carrier bag's worth. No one can, do you want me? Yes, please, Susanna. Can I ask a question? Oh. Yes, please. Um, you talked about hawthorn. Yes. So how, what, what, is it in flower now? Is it going to bury? And how would you harvest that? Right, thank you. Yeah, so in early summer, and 
sorry early summer late spring it goes into flower and leaf so mm -hmm. the, like I so said the flowers and the leaf of early summer are the most medicinal rich but the flowers are still pretty high in the nutritional medicinal value and now we're kind of going into late summer we're going to be getting and I have seen the berries but they're still not at their their most vibrant red so you can still gather the leaves they're still nutritionally medicinally rich but now's the time to obviously gather the berries so they're, they're very easy to um, harvest again if that's going to be your herb of choice get about a carrier bag's worth get a decent amount and the leaves pull off really easily and so do the berries and you um, I would suggest again to dry them that's just the simplest way and then you can always turn it into something else along the uh, further on down the line thank you no problem uh, sorry Susanna I'm so bad with zoom I'm so sorry everybody I was able to unmute myself so I'm not sure Make host. There we go. Yes. So everyone, you should be able to unmute yourselves now if you want to ask a question. And um, what we could do as well is if you move your cursor over, you should be able to raise a hand so that um, it's a bit clearer who wants to ask a question. So does anybody else have questions? Well, I had a question. I wondered what it means when we're talking about um, elderflower being a prophylactic. Yes. So prophylactic means that you take you take something in order to um, offset the chance of, or you take it before the symptoms arise to counteract the symptoms. Right. Cool. And now we're coming into elderberry season as well. I saw some elderberries earlier down the road and they're obviously really high and um, really good and used a lot in herbal medicine for the antiviral properties. So now that we've come to the, we're coming to late summer, we're now going to be going into autumn in the next sort of month or two, having the berries and being able to use them and, as their antiviral properties for when cold and flu season comes as well. Cold and flu season comes around, is really useful as well. And how would you prepare those? So again, you can dry them if you like. They're a little bit more prone to fungal rot as all berries are. Um, so you could probably, you could try to dry them or you could turn them into a syrup straight away. You can find some really good recipes online for syrups and you don't always have to use sugar. You can use honey too. Um, but I find that sugar is a better preservative. And uh, herbal syrups, elderberry syrups normally last between three and six months. Can I ask a question about dandelion, please? Mm -hmm. So the, the, obviously there's a leaves and the flower head. Have, have they got different properties, different um, kind of, yeah, different properties? Yeah. So, so typically it's, it's the aerial part. So the leaves and the flowers mm. and the roots that we use, it, that we use differently. Um, the leaves are really rich in potassium, as are the flower heads as well. And because they're yellow, anything that's got a really vibrant colour, like a carrot, a dandelion, anything that's got a really vivid red or orange has got a thing called a beta carotene in it. So I'm sure everybody's, I imagine everybody's heard of beta carotenes in their um, antioxidant use. So we would use that as its kind of antioxidant potassium rich source. And we would use the root more for its, its more rich it's very rich in potassium and very rich in um i don't like to use this word detox because i don't agree with detox but it's very good at stimulating um liver bile it helps it's a bitter it has bitter properties to it so anything that has a bitter properties bitter constituents helps to stimulate digestion so leaves and flowers we use for their um potassium and mineral rich qualities and the root we use for the bitter properties. Thank you. 
No problem. Hi, could I ask about the hay fever? Because yeah, mine is increasingly worse, and I am taking antibiotics. So, do you have to? Well, you basically had to take all of these things. So you had to take nettles and elderflower and to be really effective. Yes. Um. So. Do you know which? Because I skip bits. Is basically what I'm asking. Yeah, of course. So the thing is, you can find plants are going to have interchangeable chemicals in them. So they're going. Some are going to be rich, and some in particular chemicals, and some are going to still have them, but have different chemicals that overarch those chemicals. I would say number one, the best remedy for hay fever is nettles. Amongst, I had a nasty feeling you were going to say that. Ah, uh, do you not like nettles? Nope. No, have you tried taking them? Um, in what form have you tried to take them? I try and avoid them in all forms. So. Right, okay. Is it the taste or just, just the thought of it? Oh no, they're mm. such a fantastic plant. Honestly, I know. I, mean, I have I, to be brave. I'm afraid so. I think if it's the taste that you don't like, then you can take something like a tincture. So that's really you're, all you're getting there is kind of the taste of alcohol really you're not getting that kind of very green taste that you get with nettles and you can get nettle tinctures very easily I think even Holland and Barrett does them okay um but if you're really against nettles then try the German chamomile it's it's very rich in azulene and that's the the key compound that you're looking for so that has um obviously a sweeter taste a bittersweet kind of taste okay, okay. thank you no problem but yes, I know what you mean. Nettles do have that very, very earthy, green kind of quality to them. Composty. <laughs> yes, well, some can say that. <laughs> and I feel like, can I go back to the hawthorn um, yes. leaves? Because I've got one in the garden. Um, what would you use the leaves for? Or just would you stick them in a salad or... Yeah, you can definitely stick them in a salad. They're not, they're not the nice, they're not, they're not, they're slightly bland tasting, okay. I would say. Um, but their main chemical constituent, or what we use them in herbal medicine, is for high blood pressure and for heart conditions. So hawthorn is a fantastic herb for anybody that has any heart conditions. And I genuinely mean this. The research out there is completely there to back it up. So our heart beats like that. It has a contraction what hawthorn does and it, it, by that contraction it expends energy by doing that so what hawthorn does is it it helps it it almost takes over that contraction without expending any more energy it helps to regulate irregular heartbeats and it helps what would say with weak heart weak heart and it helps to um so strengthen the muscles of the heart it's a vasodilator what that means is that it helps to dilate the veins so if you do have um high blood pressure it's going to be beneficial there as well but if you're going to be using the berries they're going to be really rich in those um anthrocyanins so they help support vascular health vascular health has been linked to all sorts of nasty conditions um so anything that's got a right any berry that has that bright redness is going to be helping vascular health. Thank you. No problem. So somebody's asked about picking weeds only in garden or curbside. So I definitely, I would avoid picking um, weeds by the roadside just because you don't know what's happened to them. Um, people might be spitting on them or dog wee and all sorts of nastiness. Um, definitely try to find them in a local park or um when with scrubs i go to a lot an, an open space where you know the ground hasn't been contaminated shall we say so is there anything for lowering cholesterol and um, garlic's got a lot of research behind lowering cholesterol um there's there's quite a bit of um research talking about um HDL and LDL and then is high cholesterol actually impacting on our heart health but definitely um, making sure that you have a sufficient amount of vitamin D so spending enough time outside exposing the back of your neck exposing your arms making sure you're eating enough oily fish and plenty and plenty of garlic so will elderflower so you don't typically make elderflower syrup you typically make um, elderberry syrup 
for hay fever. So it's the elder flowers, not the berries that you would be using for hay fever. And you would just generally take those as a tea or a tincture. Is normal garlic used in cooking? Yep, that's absolutely fine. It doesn't have to be wild at all. All you want to be able to do is know that you've crushed it because you'll, you're, when you crush garlic, that's when you get the smell. That will be chemical, chemical constituents reacting that's going to help the cholesterol lowering effect. Has Has anybody, else, anyone else got any other questions? Somebody was asking in the chat um, mm. about a book or where they could find more information as well, I think. Okay, um, so there's a couple of books. Um, there's a really old book that I use. I wish I'd brought it with me, but I can, I can um, email later. It's basically Nate, um, Fauna of UK and, and of Britain and Ireland, Flora and Fauna of Britain and Ireland. That's a really useful book. The key that they use is really good. I'm not really a fan of any of the apps that you can use that you take a picture with and that identifies with it because I've heard and I've experienced it misidentifying pretty dodgy plants, to be honest. Um, otherwise, there's a, um, what, what do you call those books with the yellow banner on the top? About an identifying book. Sorry? Dawning in Kindersley, no? No. Oh, um... Campbell or something like that? Hamlin. Maybe. But definitely The Flora and the Fauna of the British Isles and, I and Ireland is a fantastic book. I got mine on um, eBay for about 50p. It's from the 70s, but it's still very good. The key is fantastic. Uh, yes, that's about recognising them, Sarah, about the how to identify the plants. Um, about using plants there's a really good book called From Root to Stem by Alex Laird that's really good for recipes and remedies throughout the seasons that's it yes thank you uh, Susanna. And it's also just about going out and making and finding a plant and completely understanding it when you recognised it. So going back to St. John's Wort, some people, it's a very easy one to identify because the na the clue is in the name, the perforatum, those leaves do look like they have those tiny little pinhead holes in them. So when you find something and you just really study it and look closely, then you get a deeper connection with the plant and you're always going to be able to recognize it thereafter. There, there's a lot of dietary change for cholesterol. I would suggest that it's a bit more complicated than just kind of, um, there, there are plants that I can name you and, and like garlic, but things there has to be dietary changes with lowering cholesterol. Vitamin D, like I said, is one of the most crucial vitamins and hormones because it's both. It's interchangeable in our body to be able to normalize our cholesterol levels. So dietary changes, making sure you're eating enough um, oily, oily foods, omega rich foods, making sure that you're having enough um, foods that are going to help vasodilate and to repair those arteries and veins within your body. So stuff that are rich in antioxidants, anthrocyanidins. So think of the really vibrant colored foods, beetroots, berries, anything that has that sort of really vivid red or purple color is going to be helping our venous system, typically as a rule of thumb. So it's not just about how we can affect our cholesterol, but how can we affect the channels within those cholesterols, within where the cholesterol is, and then how can we help break that down? Um, but definitely garlic, you can eat, it sounds a bit disgusting, but you can have a garlic juice if you want to have a real hit of something that's going to be affecting your um, cholesterol. But first and foremost, look at your diet, you know, and look at how much you're moving. And then we can talk about herbs and plants that are going to help increase that process as well. 
Has anybody, maybe you could do like a raise of hands, has anybody collected anything this summer that they've used medicinally or nutritionally or made anything? A wild garlic pesto or, or a chickweed pesto or anything like that? Yep, I'm seeing a few hands. Well done. That's good to see. Calendula for tea. Fantastic. I tried to grow some calendula and it did not work out very well at all. Um, so I'm really pleased that somebody's done that. Mint. Yes, fantastic. Mint. So this is another thing. When we're picking really aromatic plants like mint, we want to make sure we're collecting them in the, in the morning on a dry day. That's when the oils are really at their peak and they smell beautiful. And lots of nettle soup, well done. Very good. Wild garlic pesto and elderflower syrup, wow, fantastic. I'm really running low on my wild garlic now. I'm a bit annoyed that it's, it's going out of season. So we're coming close to the end and I'm really sorry about the Zoom issues, everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm a technophobe and I, and I have to admit it and I, need to, and I need to get better, it's one of my vices. But is there anything else that anybody would like to pick? What do you pick lavender now or at the end of season so the best time to pick lavender is just by looking at it so you should be able to see that then when some of the flower heads have opened at the top you want to be able to pick your lavender heads like I said with most flowers just before they go into full bloom because then they're still rich in those medicinal nutritional qualities they're still holding on to their goodness shall we say before they give them away to the bees and the other pollinators so if you look at a lavender head the top maybe one quarter will be open and the rest are still closed. That's the best time to pick your lavender. With all flowers, the rule of thumb is you want to pick it just as, about, as it's about to burst. Um, it's like if we think about things that are good for us, in plants with our phytochemicals and their phytonutrients, everything's contained within the skin. That's the antimicrobial and the antiseptic qualities of the plant. The seed, because that's where it needs to to regenerate, to germinate. So it's really holding on to those fantastic um, anti-inflammatories and nutrients there. The pith that holds everything together and the flowers. This is where it's most vital and it's most vibrant within the plant. So this is what we're using in our bodies to help counterbalance any maladies that we have. So I'm going to try and <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try and attach this hand out again for you guys if I can if you if you can't do it don't worry because we've got the mailing list of people who's who've joined and and um, you can send it to Susanna or Northwick Park email and okay. then relate it that way yeah, brilliant yeah. thank you great well that's absolutely brilliant Regine Thank really you. fantastic um and i think it's a big thank you from everybody it certainly looks like it from the chat so yeah thank you so much everybody really, really and again appreciate. sorry sorry and, for my incompetence um, with technology <laughs> and i think it it um you know gives a lot of ideas for things to maybe extend in the garden actually as definitely well. yeah um, that would be brilliant you know potentially introduce um once we get to the planting stage more you know when we do some more planting so that's absolutely fantastic thank you so much and no, you're more than welcome it was such a pleasure thank you yeah and thank you everybody for coming yeah and hope that you found it useful it's been really nice to see everyone's face i'm sorry we haven't done introductions today but we wanted to make sure that we had maximum amount of time with regine um being able to talk and and use her expertise so um we will be there'll be another workshop in late august i think about uh, again we're going to have a look at the plants in the garden so we're going to have a further look at other plants in the garden um which would be great if you're around and would like to participate in that um you know let let us know if you'd yeah. like to introduce some plants yes that would be um, lovely really cool. yeah yeah real pleasure definitely yeah. cool yeah, all I right then. ramble so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so thank you very much and we will see everyone soon and in the garden hopefully thank you very much thank you thank, thank you everybody right. take care bye 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 bye, bye. <laughs> bye.